that's what I tell my online course students, Guy, is the difference between tasting and drinking is thinking. It's the difference between going to a movie and just enjoying it. Maybe you're not going to a full-blown movie critic, but you're going to watch for things like character development and narrative. You don't need to become a full-fledged sommelier, but enjoy it on a few more levels now. It's like you go to the Louvre in Paris and <laughs> you look at some of these paintings on the wall, but then you learn about the person who painted it and how long ago that was and what were they thinking and why is it called that type of painting? And you learn to appreciate stuff a lot more when you do that. Exactly. I was a dancer for years. So when I go to a ballet, I have a muscular response to what's going on there. Others in the audience who might not have a dance background, they're still enjoying it. But that full-bodied appreciation comes from having trained in a discipline. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 185. What exactly makes the sense of smell so evocative? How can you play with food and wine pairing to discover new delicious flavors? And what can you do to de-risk your exploration of new wines, especially when you're buying a case in the liquor store? You'll hear those stories and more in my chat with Guy Bauer, the host of The Good Life Show on KNSS News Talk Radio in Wichita, Kansas. Guy is actually interviewing me. Now, on a personal note, before we dive into the show with the continuing story of publishing my new wine memoir, Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Depression, and Drinking Too Much. The reason I love reading memoirs is that they straddle the line between self-help books and novels, and yet they're neither. I always learn from someone else's experience, but enjoy the far more personal perspective. For instance, how did another woman handle a sudden and unexpected divorce? How did she start dating again and perhaps find new love? I'm not looking for the 12 essential steps to divorce recovery. I can read a self-help book for that. Rather, I want to know how the author felt when she got the news. How did she deal with it? What did she try that failed? And of course, what worked? But always, how did it feel? What was she thinking? I want to be inside her mind and her body vicariously so I can compare my own thoughts and feelings to hers. Similarly, I love reading memoirs for the novel-like aspects. There's a hero or heroine who's on a journey. There's a crisis or several and overcoming obstacles. And finally, and ideally for me, a happy ending that's cathartic. Unlike self-help and other nonfiction books, memoirs use the techniques of fiction, from narrative drive and plot to character development and dialogue. Though, of course, they're based on real-life experience. If you also enjoy memoirs and you have a favorite one, please let me know what I should read next. I'll share a beta reader review with you now, and this one is from Jennifer Wilhelm Rose from Niagara, Ontario. Quote, In her memoir, Natalie McLean invites us into her raw and often painful journey of self-reflection and discovery. She beckons us to come with her as she gathers the courage to pull aside the curtain and reveal the great and powerful marketing world, creating the insidious haze of smoke and mirrors, influencing our consumer choices, buying behaviors, and daily habits. She dares us to question, as she begins to herself, the long-standing systemic biases and sexism, not only in the beverage alcohol world, but also within corporations, marriages, society as a whole, and even those that dangerously reside within our minds. She opens our eyes to what we may otherwise absorb as the norm. She makes us squirm as we're forced to look at what it really is and reminds us that tyranny needs complacency to grow. Along the way, she reminds us 
that behind every celebrity is a human being. Behind the screens, at a keyboard much like ours, sits a real-life person with fears and self-doubts much like ours, with friends and family whom they love, choices they agonize over, challenges, dreams, and regrets much like ours. In an era of cancel culture, it may seem so easy to see them as black and white, to pass judgment, to publicly condemn with keyboard courage and self-righteousness, before giving them a chance to explain, to tell their story. Natalie tells her story here with honesty, vulnerability, and courage. She shares her mistakes, the struggles with her decisions, and in an effort to rise above, she confronts herself. The discussion questions at the end of the book prompt readers to thoughtfully consider and discuss important issues, both personal and societal. A well-written and thought-provoking memoir that lingers in our minds long after the final page has been turned. Thank you, Jennifer. I've posted a link to a blog post called Diary of a Book Launch in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 185. This is where I share more behind-the-scenes stories about the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at the manuscript. Email me at natalie at nataliemclean.com. Okay, on with the show. Great program today. A gal that has been on the program before. Her name is Natalie McLean. She's like the guru of wine in North America, certainly in Canada where she lives. And I just don't know how she does all that she does. She's nice enough to let us invade her weekend. If I told you everything that she does, it would take up the first quarter of the show. So without further ado, we'll just say, hi, Natalie. Welcome back to the program. Hey, Guy. It's great to chat with you again. I mean that, Natalie. I just, I know... And I am attracted and like to talk to people who are busy and do so much. And I think compared to any other wine writer, critic, author in all of North America, I don't think anybody does more on a daily and weekly basis than you do. Well, I like to keep myself out of trouble, Guy. And, uh, you know, what can I say? I love my subject. I drink for a living. So how bad can it be? (laughs) Yeah, people always say that to me, too. And I say, well, I don't really drink for a living, but I sure like to. And we're going to talk extensively about the website because there is where folks can interact with you. And even though you write about and feature a lot of wines from Canada and they're brilliant, a lot of them we can't get here but you have a way around that. And you have wines uh, this past week's wines of the week. There's some brilliant wines that are available locally here and we'll do that. But let's go way back. Go back to the beginning, Natalie, and tell me what got you interested in wine and uh, other than, yes, we both love to eat and drink. Where did the light bulb come on that set you on fire? Well, cue the way back music or the harp, whatever they play. Um, You know, I didn't grow up in a a wine-loving family guy because I grew up in the East Coast, Scottish family, so it was beer and whiskey on the table. And I really didn't get into wine until I'd finished um, graduate school and had the money to get fancy. And My husband and I liked to go to restaurants, and we started trying wine. I remember one particular wine. We went to an Italian bistro around the corner from our apartment, and the server came over and he said, would you like a Brunello? And I said, sure, thinking it was a pasta dish. Sounds good. (laughs) And then he brought over the bottle, and it was this robust, beautiful northern Italian red wine, and he poured it in a tumbler. No fancy sniffing and glassware. (laughs) And it was a beautiful introduction to wine because I didn't know how to describe it, but as soon as I started smelling it and then tasting it, I thought, oh my gosh, what is this? I have to learn more about this. I have to learn how to describe it because I want to ask for it again. I want to drink it again. Isn't that funny that everyone I know that is a wine writer, a wine producer, whatever, when I ask them that go way back question, most everybody has that aha moment. You know, even if you had been drinking Boone's Farm or White Zin or whatever, when somebody either deliberately or accidentally pours you some magnificent wine and you never forget it, it's a big motivator. It was for me. And as you know, Guy, the sense of smell and taste, of course, really is evocative. I mean, it's the only sense that's tied to emotions and memory in our brain. 
the rest of our senses have to be processed through indirect circuits. And that's why, you know, well, Proust, a remembrance of things past, you know, he eats the Madeleine, the little biscuit, and all his life unfolds in front of him. So, you know, just one sip of that Brunello, and I'm right back there. Yeah. And certainly when it comes to wine, I, I just don't think there's anything that can evoke those kind of readily available memories and sensations and feelings and magnificent glass of wine. And, uh, Absolutely. And that's the fun part. Then you have done so much. Okay. So I'm not, I don't even remember the basics of when you started actively writing about wine and felt that you had the qualifications and the ability to put reviews together. And when you built your website, go deeper. <laughs> Well, I say I started drinking when I met my husband and haven't found a reason to stop. He's now my ex, by the way, but that's a whole different other story. So I've been writing about wine for about 20 years now, more than 20 years, and I just learned as I went. I I think I still feel like I'm an enthusiastic amateur, even though, you know, I have taken courses and so on and written books, but I'm always learning, and I love that about wine. I mean, it is the deep dive. You can go in as deep as you like and learn about different regions and grapes and styles and food pairings. So as I went along, I added more and more uh, things <laughs> to my plate, to my glass, from starting with articles to reviewing actively hundreds of wines every month or actually sometimes every week of widely available wines that you can get in your your area, not so much the Canadian wines, but I review lots of wines from the U.S. Yeah. and around the world. So anyway, I just, you know, I guess I just learned as I went and I love being nosy. So that's why I wrote the book. So I could ask really nosy, impertinent questions that I'd never ask someone over dinner. That's why I launched a podcast. You know, I, I, I learned from others. Yeah. Well, learn by doing is a great way. You can have all manner of certificate and training. But doing, tasting, and talking is a great thing. Um, You have grown immensely in the number of followers and the number of wine reviews that you have listed. And what are you up to now on active members at NatalieMcLean.com? We're about 307,000 thirsty people. It's a lot of glasses to fill, but uh, we try our best. And there's more than 300,000 wine reviews because they also allow community members to post reviews, their own reviews on our website, which in turn are available on the mobile apps for iPhone and Android. So, I mean, it's just exploded as a community, but it's so much fun. I mean, I just love being in touch with all these people who are passionate about wine and hearing their stories as well. Well, and and I think the benefit that you have over others is you are accessible. Whether you like it or not, yeah. you are accessible. And, <laughs> and and that can be a blessing or it can be a real pain in the butt. No, what do you, generally, I find it. I like that. I mean, I have to. I, it's how I got into the world of wine, by following and talking to people who are accessible or conversational. You know, for me, every time I sit down to write a newsletter, I want the person reading it to feel like we're just having a chat over the kitchen table. Same with the podcast. Same with the books. I mean, there's just no need for snobbery and whatever. You know, I do think that's going away for a lot of the wine world. But I just think we open up more when we're talked to one-on-one. I think humor has a great place in the world of wine to make us relax. You know, science has told us we're never more receptive than when we've just laughed, like, you know, in in terms of learning. So why not just have a conversation and have fun with it? Yeah. You don't know this, but... I've been teaching various wine appreciation and food and wine pairing classes at Wichita State University for uh, since 98 or 99. Wow. That's and great. the school was always amazed that we would sell out every time. You know, we only mm. could seat 40. I bought the glasses. So there were all, I had enough glasses for eight wines a piece for 40 with some spares. And I always started those classes, Natalie, with, you know, you probably don't really need a course to teach you how to like wine. You you wouldn't be here if you didn't already like it. Right. But what I'm going to do is make you think about it and talk about it. And that's just like that same thing you said. You know, if you and I sat together and opened five bottles of wine, people would go, you opened five bottles? Yeah, we didn't drink them all. It's a tasting, not a drinking. And and to sip and and talk about them and smell them. I mean, even 
I've always said if you couldn't drink, at least if I have a good stem and and I can put some wine in the glass and swirl it around, and I have a lot of pictures of me with my face in a glass. I like to smell wine, but uh, exactly, and that's what I tell my online course students, guy, is the difference between tasting and drinking is thinking, and that doesn't mean it's no fun, but it's the difference between going to a movie and just enjoying it, and that's great, and going to a movie and saying, I want to get a little bit more out of this. Maybe you're not going to full-blown movie critic, but you're going to watch for things like character development and narrative and all the rest of it. That's what you're doing with wine. I want to go a little deeper. I still want to enjoy it. I don't need to become a full-fledged sommelier, but I want to think about this a little bit more so that I actually deepen my pleasure of it because I enjoy it on a few more levels now. Oh, man. Well, it's like you go to the Louvre in Paris. And you look at some of these paintings on the wall. Worse yet, you go to a modern art studio in our country. And, <laughs> and you look at some of these paintings and you go, nah, bleh. but then you learn about the person who painted it and how long ago that was and what were they thinking and why is it called that type of painting? And you learn to appreciate stuff a lot more when you do that. Exactly. I was a dancer for years. And so when I go to a ballet, I have a muscular response to what's going on there. You know, others in the audience who might not have a dance background, you know, they're still enjoying it, but there's something, that full-bodied appreciation that comes from having trained in a discipline. Yeah, like you go, oh, that that's going to hurt tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, well. Them, not me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> well, when, you know, you said how long you've been doing this, and then I'm thinking, God, you started wine writing at 12. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, I was just a toddler. <laughs> well, yeah. You've held up well, I can I can tell you that. Uh, well, but, I'm perfectly preserved. I like to say I'm pickled <laughs> with all this wine. <laughs> uh, what a great thing to do. Now, Nat, let's talk a little bit about, first, we're going to keep it focused on you, some of your favorite things. And I'll be the question guy, you be the answer girl. Um, all right. Okay, we love those aha moments. You already touched on your Italian wine moment. People ask me this all the time. If you could only drink one wine, what's it going to be? Holy smokes. I, I assume someone else is paying. First of all, we have to establish that. Yes. So I'm going to assume that. Um, sure. Pour me some Domaine Romani Conti, the benchmark Burgundy yeah. from France. Why not? I love Pinot. Yeah. All <laughs> yeah. right. Then now what about you're paying and you've got a $60, $70 limit? Hmm. Okay. Pretty good parameters. I love La Crema Pinot Noir from California, especially their cool climate. Monterey, beautiful, silky, satin, medium bodied, not too much oak or alcohol, but bursting with fleshy ripe cherries. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It, it amazes me. I mean, Pinot thrives in cooler climate, but some of the things they're doing in, in the Central Coast, I think, are comparative or even better than what happens in Carneros. And I love yeah. to see that. What about your favorite food and wine memory? Huh. Well, I like high, low, shabby chic. So I love doing, you know, champagne and potato chips or popcorn. Oh, I love yeah. the, you know, that swarm of bubbles, that effervescence just fills your palate of the butter or fat of the chips or whatever, the popcorn. And then you're ready for another bite and it tastes almost as good as the first one. You keep going. I can finish a bag no problem that way. <laughs> you and me <laughs> both. I like a big, rich, buttery Chardonnay with movie theater buttered popcorn. Oh, yes. Please. And we all know it's right. not butter. It's some kind of fake oil thing, but... Oh, that's okay. Yeah. But we're not going to think about that. We're yeah. just going to enjoy. <laughs> when you think of, uh, and again, people, we collectively, but certainly people that are learning new and exploring more about food and wine pairing, always say, well, you know, what about uh, red wine with meat, white wine with fish? And and we all know that that, yeah, you, you know, it's something you can hang your hat on. Your best food and wine peering experience that you have either engineered or been uh, served. And then mm -hmm. probably more importantly, to follow that with the most unusual. Okay. Let's see. I think the best food and wine pairing I've ever had was a Valentine's Day dinner that my partner cooked for me. He's a good cook, thank God, because I don't cook. <laughs> um, and Valentine's Day is coming around, so I should, probably should speak a little louder so he hears me. But uh, <laughs> reminder, reminder. But he did a lovely uh, poached salmon, and we had a rosé champagne from oh. Billicart Salmon. Oh, it was so gorgeous. The pink and pink, but also the flavors. It was yeah. just melt in your mouth kind of 
Love him forever for that, you know, <laughs> and other things. <laughs> and, well, and there and now, and you, we both know this, but a lot of people don't appreciate it. Certainly, in retrospect, if not on the moment, oftentimes it's not really the wine and the food; it's who and where you are. Exactly. That's why you can have a beautiful, inexpensive little wine beside the Mediterranean when you're traveling uh. and it's and you're with someone you love or your best friend or whatever, and then you take that same bottle back to your rainy, cold apartment, and it's like, what happened? This bottle changed. No, you did. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. your perception and the uh, atmosphere. I love that. How about the weirdest thing? There's nothing out of bounds because in our collective opinion, I believe I can say that for us, you know, drink what you like. If you want white Zim with your steak, knock yourself out. There's no party foul unless you make it. What's some of the weirdest things you've ever paired with or enjoyed that was a surprise? Yeah, so, so I've had um, Twizzlers, the red licorice, with <laughs> Zinfandel. It was actually a uh, dry red Zinfandel, but because the beautiful California Zin had so much berry ripeness and fairly high alcohol, and as you know, alcohol can give the perception of sweetness, mm -hmm. it was beautiful. It was just like, oh, yes, the new way to have... Twizzlers is dipped in a California Zin. It's just plain out weird, but it worked. <laughs> I wrote an article about it and then did a TV segment for a local channel on this craze that came out several years ago of pairing Girl Scout cookies with wine. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and I said, no, I'm not doing that. You're crazy. <laughs> but I said, okay, okay. So I'll open-mindedly give it a try. And that wasn't blown away with anything. But I did have a barefoot Zinfandel. Huh. Now we're talking, you know, she makes beautiful wines at the price point, And this was a fruit forward is not good enough. It was unctuously fruit forward with a hint mm -hmm. of sweetness. This is Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. And that with any of the cookies was good. Oh, you know, I and have to try that. Well, then in a, for a, a more serious pairing, I have pretty fond memories of taking really salty pretzels and having them with bubbly. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, because the salt will make the perception of if there's a, even a modicum of residual sugar, it kind of makes that stand out and any bubbly. But that, oh, and, yeah, no. you know, pairing. we lived in Spain when I was in the Air Force, and it was one of the most glorious times of my life. And I used to invite the whole squadron of fighter pilots and their wives out to the house and I would cook ribs all afternoon and we would go through cases of fresh and a mm. we called it mm. Frex and <laughs> you know it, it was well it made my wife's nickname stick to this day of bubbles that's her okay nickname. yeah that's a good nickname it is a good nickname and she's good at it that you uh Two books already. Is there another wine book in your near future? There is. So the first one was Red, White, and Drunk All Over. The ah. second one was Unquenchable. You can tell how seriously I take my topic. But the third one, Guy, is going to be a memoir. And it's about my life in the uh, the wine industry. It's a real behind-the-scenes story of what really goes on. So it is a blend of learning about wine, but also kind of if you've ever dreamed about getting into the industry or finding out like, gosh, I might like to write about wine, start a winery, whatever. I think folks will be interested. And the thing I'm doing right now, Guy, is looking for beta readers. So if anyone wants a sneak peek at the manuscript, they can email me and they can take a look at the book before it's published. So if they want to email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com, I welcome anybody who's interested. Well, it's uh, just one of the many things you do. Okay. Instead of me blowing your horn, I'm going to let you do it so I don't mess anything up. You have no been privileged to get some pretty high accolades from both Canada and the United States. Share with some of those with us. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the ones that has been meaningful to me and most recent is the New York Times picked my podcast, Unreserved Wine Talk, as one of the seven best on drinks. So I was pretty happy about that. Yeah. And, you know, you've got a listening audience right here. So if they want to listen to more about wine, they can find me on any podcast catcher app, either under my name, 
or Unreserved Wine Talk. Uh, search will get them there. But yeah, I've, I've been writing books and there have been writing awards along the way. But I think, you know, I'm most gratified by the response I get from the people who either read my books or take my online courses. Food and Wine Pairing is my jam. There's a wine for jam. Um, <laughs> but they can all find me, as you've said so kindly, at my website, nataliemcclain.com. You know, you're always giving away something. And on your website right now, if everyone goes to nataliemcclain.com, you're giving away the ultimate food and wine pairing guide. Yes, it's a free download, and it's like a template that people like to either keep on their phones or they can print it out if they like and keep it in the kitchen or the wine cellar, and it just gives all the major food groups, red wine, white wine, sparkling, rosé, dessert wine, and what pairs best with them, a range of dishes. So it's a quick guide to stimulate some new pairings for you. Yep, and the fun part about that is it's like a recipe. Recipes yeah. are great. You can follow them precisely, or you can go, gosh, that sounds good, but I really like, I'm going to put a little more cumin in that recipe. Or in this right. case, I'm going to try a little bit different wine with the pairing suggestion. And that, that's what I like. It's all about having fun and then uh, playing with your food and wine. It is. Yeah, it should be just a great big experiment. And, and that's what I encourage my online course students to do. Don't get nervous about finding the wine. Just have fun with it. And, you know, go into the liquor store, buy a case of wine, talk to the store staff and just say, hey, I like, I don't know, a full-bodied uh, Malbec. What do you suggest? And maybe they'll say, well, try this Shiraz, try this Cabernet from Chile, you know, and just de-risk it that way. Just experiment, take it home. I'll bet you'll find two or three wines that are your new favorites. Yep. I like on the site, there's also yet another free downloadable Insider's Guide to New Cheese and Wine Pairing. and mm, I love cheese and wine pairings. I just, That's my other thing that I love to... I mean, cheese is almost as varied as wine. The different yeah. types and countries and rinds and flavors. I also offer a course on cheese and wine pairing specifically. But yeah, I just never run out of different combinations when it comes to cheese and wine. Well, I, I love this. I got a... Uh, I think it was last week. It was from the Wisconsin Cheese Board, uh, you know, with a, mm. their, and it talks about the most popular cheeses state by state. I don't know if I'll buy into every state that they have there, but it's interesting. And it talks about some of the basic cheeses that we all know and love. And, you know, everybody thinks of Kraft cheddar cheese or simple low acid cheddar cheese. Well, this one has a, a pretty good array of stuff. And we're going to talk about that a little later. But, Natalie, I can't tell you again how much I appreciate all the time you spent with us and can't wait to see the new book. But more importantly, it's great to see all that you've done and all that you offer for us wine enthusiasts at nataliemcclain.com. Oh, Guy, it's been so great to reconnect with you. We'll have yeah. to uh, do it in person one of these days when oh, we can God. have a glass or three together. Well, you know, now as a retired aviator, as much time as I've spent in Canada on layovers for FedEx, I should have tried to find you on one of those days, but we just have to come visit or absolutely better yet. We should invite you to Wichita, put you up, pay you to come down here and we'll do a, an event for our chapter of the American Institute of Wine and Food. One of the few oh, remaining active chapters. Yeah. Yeah. I could do it too. When my new book comes out, maybe Ooh, combine it all together. Even better. Yeah. Well, there you go. It's a plan. We will do it. I want you to have a great weekend. What's left of it? And uh, you too, did you guy. did you get much snow out of this last uh, front that passed through? No, it's just a nice, crisp, clean covering of snow. It's very uh, wintry, but we're always very wintry here. <laughs> so yeah, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Well, have a great weekend and keep in touch. And we'll talk to you again soon. All right, guy. Cheers. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Guy. In the show notes, you'll find my email contact, the full transcript of my conversation with Guy, links to his radio show and website, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. You'll also find a link to my free online class, Five Food and Wine Pairing Mistakes That Can Ruin Your Dinner and How to Fix Them Forever. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 185. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or want to be a beta reader of my new memoir at natalie 
at nataliemcclain.com. You won't want to miss next week when I chat with Eugenia Keegan, the general manager and vice president of the Oregon Portfolio for Jackson Family Wines, which includes Penner Ash, Willa Kenzie, Grand Moraine, Zena Crown, Sidori, and La Crema. She's a pioneering legend in the wine industry and has some fabulous stories to share about her decades-long career. In the meantime, if you missed episode 31, go back and take a listen. I chat about pairing food and charcuterie with author Jennifer McLagan. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. I always said with the fat book, if you eat fat, you stay thin. Because fat, fat, and it's true, you know, people always said to me, they said, well, you know, how come you don't weigh, you know, 500 pounds? I said, because I eat fat. I don't eat a lot of sugar. I don't eat a lot of snack food. And fat is very satisfying. And the other important thing about that to remember is that's where the flavor is. A lot of flavors are only carried through fat. You can't get the flavor out of a lot of food without fat. And that's why if you eat fat-free food, it's really not satisfying at all. And you eat twice as much. Right. Sounds like the alcohol in wine. It's the carrier of flavor. Yeah, exactly. And people try to make de-alcoholized wines and it's like, ugh. <laughs> well, exactly. There is no, and you know, it's not that thing. I mean, you don't probably want a super high alcoholic wine, but alcohol, fat, they carry the flavor. They add to the whole deliciousness of the product. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines and stories we discussed. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week, perhaps a versatile summery rosé. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.